Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Democratic legislative leaders join us for a discussion on the latest issues at the state capitol, and we'll hear about a new report on the role of women in media. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Each month during the legislative session, we hear from leadership in both the House and Senate. And tonight, we welcome Senate Minority Leader Anna Tovar and House Minority Leader Chad Campbell. Good to see you both again. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Let's get us started with this, this idea of repealing those election changes that came through at the end of the last session. Folks got enough signatures to get it on the ballot to say, we don't want it. Lawmakers are saying, we don't want it either. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a huge problem because essentially it's a slap in the face of the voters. Um, this bill was passed in the middle of the night in last session. It was a Christmas tree of voter suppression items. Um, we had a rally today, and essentially what Democrats want is the, for the will of the voters to prevail and to allow them to vote on this repeal, um, this election cycle. And this is, you know, this suppression bill is nothing new. Across the nation, there are over 19 different states that are putting in similar legislation to make it tougher and create barriers for minorities and for elderly to vote. So it's an issue that we're gonna continue the fight, but essentially what voters should be very upset at is the fact that legislators feel that they know what's best for them. And yet, those legislators are saying, we're just doing what these voters wanted, these people that signed the petitions, they want to get rid of this thing, we're getting rid of this thing. Yeah, and the problem with that theory, though, or that, that claim from the Republicans is, we offered an amendment on the House floor this past week that would have delayed the effectiveness, or effective date, I should say, of the measure. So it would have gone to the ballot, allowed the voters to actually vote on it, and if they had passed it, it would have stayed in, it wouldn't have gotten in effect until next year, or if they repealed it, they repealed it, uh, but would have allowed the voters to still have their choice and make their voices be heard without putting in place this year. And the biggest concern for us is this, and this is why we're fighting this, is they repeal it this year, it takes the referendum off the ballot, takes the referral off the ballot, excuse me, and they're going to come back and piecemeal this thing, put it together in different bills, pass it without having to go to the voters, and get this done without ever having to engage the voters of the state. Are some of the issues, though, do they need the attention of a piecemeal? I'm speaking especially about the early permanent voter list, which had a bipartisan group of county recorders saying this this was this was a mess. Well, they might have had a few uh, supporters on it, but as far as a stakeholder meeting with Democrats, we didn't have that. And we asked and urged them to have Democrats at the table to make sure that the issues that we're presenting forward uh, were issues that we approved with. So again, it, it shouldn't be about county assessors making their job easier. It should be about getting voters and making it easier for them to vote. Essentially, we want as many people to vote that are qualified, um, and that's our major goal. So the idea of someone never voting, they're on the early permanent voter list, they never vote keep them on the list? Well, it's their choice. I mean, permanent, early ballot, mm. permanent list uh, should mean exactly that, is being on as being permanent. But if these people are dropping off ballots or doing other things that the recorders and the assessors are saying, this, this, is, this is a real problem, um, should it not be addressed in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, there's ways to address these issues, the, the real issues. Uh, but to Senator Tovar's point, you know, this was packaged together with a lot of different things that were intended to suppress voter activity. And in particular, probably voters in lower income communities, minority communities, elderly communities. Um, and it's been a nationwide trend we've seen from the more conservative side of the political spectrum. But there are some legitimate concerns and let's deal with those things in a bipartisan way, work with the county recorders, work with the groups out there that actually do voter outreach and voter engagement and get these things done. But that was not what happened last year. It was forced down our throats. It was one side took every issue they, they had a problem with and put it all in this one big bill. It's like this Frankensteinian bill, as I've been calling it. And now they don't want to actually let the voters have their voices be heard. And that's the problem with this. With that in mind, and they are saying, that the Republicans are now even saying it was too big, uh, too much to it. Uh, that's why we got to get rid of it. Because if the voters say we don't want this, I mean, that's a lot of election law that is now voter protected. You concerned about that? Yeah, but I think it's going to lose at the ballot regardless, and I think anything that goes in that's unconstitutional is going to end up in court regardless and be tossed out by the courts. And we say this every year, and this is the problem. We waste so much time down there on bills that are absolutely unconstitutional and are going to end up in court, excuse me, 
and get tossed out. And we're spending taxpayer dollars left and right. We have a whole litany of bills this year. The Religious Freedom Act, as they call it or whatever, is going to be another one like that. They're going to end up in court, cost the taxpayers of the state millions of dollars, and never see the light of day. We do this time and time again. It's time the Republicans, to be quite frank with you, at the, at the majority, or the legislature, sorry, learn their lesson and pay the price for passing very bad legislation. That's what this is about. Let's let the voters have their voice be heard. So real quickly, voter rejection would block future election laws, say those who don't want this thing on the ballot. Valid? It, I mean, it is a valid concern, as, as Representative Campbell said. I mean, this was a, a bill that was, you know, had many, many different aspects of it, but ultimately its, its major goal was to suppress voters. So that's one thing that we'll be very proactive on in making sure our, our, our voters prevail. The uh, uh, Senate president wants an external audit, the, the proverbial nose to toes mm -hmm. audit of CPS or what was CPS. Is that needed? Do you agree? Absolutely, it is needed, but I, I'm one in favor of, you know, this this legislation that the president has introduced allows uh, the DOA, a department in Arizona. Um, so actually, what I'm what I would propose is have an, an external um, outside of Arizona have the eyes looking on the CPS. I mean, it doesn't do us any good to have uh, an agency in Arizona who's, you know would be biased uh, to CPS to be investigating it. I would love for an outside agency with national expertise to come in and look at Arizona. Do you want that outside agency, that audit to be A, mandatory, and B, required for future funding? Uh, I don't know about any type of mandate or requirement for funding. I don't know if I want to go that far yet. That may be a little bit much. I don't know what the details would be. I do think we have to have some external oversight of CPS. Um, my concern with the proposal from the Senate President is I'm worried this is more of a political game aimed at kind of the ongoing feud between him and the governor from last year's Medicaid battle intended to slow down the reforms around CPS. And, and we can't take more time on this. We've got to get these reforms through this session. We can't push this out to next year. We have a new legislature next year, a new governor. This has to be done. It has to be fixed under our watch. And so any delay is something that I can't accept. In other words, you're seeing a, a, a problem or perhaps a potential problem between what the governor's office and Charles Flanagan want and what maybe an audit might recommend. Well, I mean, quite frankly, we've got too many cooks in the kitchen at this point. We, we've had several different committees. We had two committees in the interim working on this. We have a new committee working on it now. We just got to roll up our sleeves and actually get to work. We know the problems. And for all my criticism of Governor Brewer and, and, and how she's handled this and the delay she, she, she put in place once this was, was made public, Flanagan has done a good job. I believe that. I think the care team report was excellently put together. And let's follow those recommendations now and start doing our job and build on that and put money and time and resources into the preventative measures to keep kids out of the system in the first place. Funding contingent on what the audit recommends? I believe it, it can be, but I think as Representative Campbell said, our focus needs to be on creating a new agency that doesn't fail our children. And we've learned our lessons from the past and we learned how kids can fall through the cracks. So essentially, with the new task force in place, the new legislation that is coming, funding is going to be a such an essential part of it. But I think the focus, again, needs to be on the preventative services um, and also the foster care aspect as well. Real quickly, uh, many folks thought that this session, CPS, would be a major issue throughout the session. Yes. Is it? I think when you see the realities of the day-to-day -day workings at the Senate and at the House, it is not the priority. We are hearing extreme bills that have nothing to do with the Arizona economy, nothing to do with public education and investing in our public education. So it is a disappointment to know, you know, being in the minority and knowing that we don't have control of the priorities that get pushed forward. But it is disappointing to see that we are not tackling CPS as we should be. You agree with that? Yeah, I do. Um, and I've heard different scenarios out there from people involved with the ongoing conversations that they're going to come down there with legislation, proposed solutions in late April, early May, I've heard. Uh, that's way too long. Uh, we cannot wait till session is almost over to start dealing with CPS. It needs to be on the, on the priority list right now, on the front burner, getting it done. Which brings me to my last point here. There's a push for a shorter legislative yes. session out there. We've got the idea of maybe 100 days, maybe adjourning on May 1st, maybe starting in February, 45 days, then you're out, adios, it's over. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a well-intended effort, but I'm not sure it's the 
right solution. Uh, we already scramble enough down there. We, we do too much in too, too short a time frame. Too many bills are introduced. We don't have full debates. And we make mistakes, and we have to come back and debate whether or not to repeal them, which is exactly what we're doing, what we discussed about at the beginning of this, this uh, show. So that kind of exemplifies why we don't want to rush this process. What we should do, and what I proposed a few years ago, is limit the amount of bills each legislator can introduce, give us eight bills each, and I can guarantee you we'll make a much more uh, thoughtful approach to the bills we introduce. If we're limited to eight, it'll take a lot more uh, pressure off the system and give us a lot more time to debate them and vote on them. What about the idea of the shorter legislative session, be it 45 days, 100 days, whatever the case may be, and then have once a month or periodically for the rest of the year these vetting sessions, these kind of... Uh, I don't know, minor league legislative sessions. What, what do you think about that? Well, regardless if the session is 100 days, 200 days, the issue of transparency is not addressed. So as long as you don't address the issue of transparency and having these meetings in the light of day, having public participation, having input, we're essentially not going to get rid of um, how the legislature is run right now. So unless we tackle the issue of transparency and accountability, um, it Regardless, it's not going to matter of how many days we're in session. Can I add one thing to that, too? This, this idea of interim committees and this ongoing work throughout the year, it's going to limit the ability for people to run for office. Most of us have outside jobs as it is. Many people can't run for office as it is because they can't leave their job for four to five months to go do this. Uh, and we don't have a legislature reflective of the actual citizens of the state any longer. We have a, a small group of people that do not reflect the general population of the state. And if you make people really shift into a, a, a time frame where they're going to have to leave their job on a monthly basis throughout the year, you're going to isolate, or not to say isolate, you're going to take a lot of people out of the running to ever run for office. And that's the last thing we should be doing is discouraging people from running for office. So other than transparency, do you see any reason for an artificial limit to a session? No, I mean, I believe Representative Campbell brings up great ideas. We need to tackle this issue and have a, a stakeholder meeting on what is most beneficial for Arizona uh, constituents. And in regards to transparency and also meeting during the interim, that's something I think has to be discussed and vetted um, and making sure that we're doing what's right for Arizona voters. All right. It's good to see you both. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. A new report by the New York and Washington-based Women's Media Center shows that disparities exist when it comes to women in the media and that because of this disparity, journalism is missing voices and missing stories. ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication will hold an event focused on the report this Wednesday at Gamage Auditorium. And joining us now to talk about women in media is Gloria Felt, co-founder and president of Take the Lead, an organization that prepares women for leadership roles, and Kristen Gilger, Associate Dean of the Cronkite School. Good to see you both here. Good to see you both Thank again, you too. too, as Thank well. You. Um, Women's Media Center, what is that? Well, the Women's Media Center is an organization, it's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to make women's voices heard, uh, to make women powerful and visible in the media. It's an organization that I've served on the board for for some years, uh, although I have term limited out, so uh, so I'm no longer on the board. But uh, because I started Take the Lead, which is also a nonprofit organization to prepare and propel women to take their equal share of leadership positions across all sectors, and actually the, uh, Take the Lead is, is hosting this event at Gamage, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that this whole issue of women in the media and the impact of media on women's leadership would be a, an important part of that conversation. 
question. So what is the status of women in the media? Oh wow, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, actually, they've been tracking this for some time, and jump in here. Um, it hasn't changed very much. Um, women represent, if you look at employment in the media, for example, women are about a third of the staff of newspapers, about a third of the management of newspapers. Uh, they represent about 40% of those in broadcast, but much smaller when you get higher up in the field, about 20% in radio. Um, and when you look at the higher level positions, then of course there are still far fewer women than men in leadership positions. You mentioned a few categories here. Define media. What are we talking about? Oh geez. <laughs> okay. Well talk about who was surveyed in this. Well, the, the, the report itself looks at radio, television, print, um, online. online, and um, sports media for the first time, I think. Mm -hmm. It also looks at a breakdowns not only by gender, but also um, minorities as well. So it's very comprehensive in its scope. I, I seem to remember, though, not so long ago, that some thought journalism was becoming a pink collar industry, for lack of a better phrase. That was a phrase that was being used there. Um, what happened there? It's what's happened in just about every profession. What has happened is that women have opened doors. Women are earning 57% of the college degrees now and have been for almost two decades. So in the professions, women get the degrees, they start into, the, into their field, and then when they start, they're about 50-50. And then as the years go on, there are fewer and fewer women closer and closer to the top so that across all sectors of professions, women are about 18% and have been stalled at that place for almost 20 years. That's why we're taking the lead and saying we gotta change that. But if you look at journalism schools, yes. um, the Cronkite School, for example, is almost 70% mm -hmm. women enrollment. And, um, and, those, and, that, and those numbers are not unusual for the Cronkite School. That's true for journalism schools across the country. And in fact, colleges, universities, are primor primarily female uh, enrollment now. I think it's around 60% or more. Um, so there's a, a great interest with women going into the field. And some people say that's because as, um, as, as the field has, has had some stresses and maybe employment's a little bit more difficult or the pay is not as much as it might have been, then that men flee to other fields and there's more openings for women. That can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. That's interesting, I hadn't heard that. What, what, what do you, obviously as a dean here, you, when you're looking at this, you're in the position of authority, you're seeing the, the kids come in, you know what they want, you know where they wanna go. How do you get them to where they wanna go and also be cognizant of these numbers? Well, you know, some of it is giving students opportunities here, while they're here, to be in leadership positions and to try things that maybe they would have a harder time getting into into the profession. So a good example of that is women in sports, for example. We have, um, we're really ramping up our sports offerings and doing a sports journalism degree at the Cronkite School because there's so much interest in sports journalism. Um, but that's driven a lot by female students. We have so many female students now who are very interested in sports journalism. And we were talking about this earlier as to why that is. And I think it has to do with other cultural changes. Um, they're coming to us and they played sports mm -hmm. all their lives. Or they're in families where um, sports has been a big deal. And it's not an unusual thing for them to think, well, why mm -hmm. not? Sports journalism. You know, I can do this. And so if they get the opportunities here, to um, you know, run organizations, to do internships, to you know, uh, run stats or whatever it is, or cameras, or do the reporting, or work for MLB.com, or uh, do our spring training program where they're going out and covering uh, the spring training teams here. They come out with this level of confidence that they can do this. I want to ask you about that because in, in taking the lead, um, you have to be a bit of a leader. Do you, can you learn that at the university level with what we just heard? Or is that kind of an innate sort of thing that 
you either got it or you don't. Well, I think that uh, there, there are perhaps some innate characteristics that some people may have more than others, but definitely these are learnable and teachable skills. And in fact, I've been teaching a course at ASU for the last five years called Women, Power, and Leadership. I have a fairly low tech definition of leadership. I believe a leader is somebody who gets something done. And I, once I start deconstructing it for people like that, it begins to be less frightening. Uh, it begins to be less, less, less of something that they would say, oh no, I don't want to do that. But, but what I'd like to, to say is that what I have found in the research that I've done, um, the last book that I wrote, uh, it really delved into it. I interviewed women all over the country. I looked at the research. I looked into my own learned, my own actual lived experience as a leader. And, and what I found is that women have an ambivalent relationship with power. And that until we grapple with that and deal with that head on, that we're not going to see women actually breaking through that 18 to 20% barrier. So that's what I hope to infuse into this whole discussion of women in leadership. Well, that, and that's, again, that's a great point. And again, when you're dealing with students and you're looking at their future, 70%. That's, that's a considerable amount there yes. in, in, in this particular capacity, and yet we see so few in the professional world. How do you get a little bit more of that, I don't know, gumption or whatever you need to make that I don't step? know. The, the, the students I work with, they've already got it. Yeah. Um, we just have to give them the opportunities. And I think that as this uh, generation of women moves into the media, they're going to take those leadership roles. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, and, and it, it, sports is another good example where um, if you look at the numbers of women in sports, you know, if uh, they're, they're not sports editors, there's 10% of the women in newspapers, 10% uh, of the sports editors at newspapers around the country are women. But there are slight increases, there are increases at the bottom level. So you see women going in as sports reporters, as producers, as web producers, as video producers, television. And so I still think that when, if they're equipped with what we can give them, if we encourage them in their practices and their leadership skills, they're going into those jobs and I think they'll, they'll move up. And I, I mentioned gumption uh, on the part mm -hmm. of, of the women. I'm sure there are quite a few with quite a lot of gumption who wind up just absolutely unable to move ahead for a variety of reasons. Are those reasons changing at all? There are still plenty of implicit biases. You know, we all live in the same cultural soup, as it were. And so both men and women ingest some of the same stereotypes about gender, even though this is 2014. There are still some of those there. I mean, we still know that if you send two resumes and one is Harry and one is Harriet, Harry is always viewed as being more qualified for the position. And so women have to be prepared for that kind of thing. And I, I believe that one of the problems we face is actually a problem of success because we have seen a woman first almost everything. And so it's easy to think there are no more problems. But then what happens is that young women enter a profession and about 10 years later they get smacked with all kinds of consequences of these implicit biases that they were not prepared for. We have to prepare them for that. Yeah, there's no female Bob Costas yet. <laughs> no, I guess there's not. Yeah. I, I, I'm assuming they all can see right now with two <laughs> eyes wide open. But you know, you, you mentioned 10 years from now and this sort of thing. In so many th ways, you can see like this 18 to 25 year old group, whether it's medical marijuana, whether it's uh, gay marriage, a whole variety of issues, they see things differently mm -hmm. than their elders, than the boomers and such. Is this a situation where we won't even be talking about this in 20 years because this generation will have moved into higher levels of power and mm -hmm. this won't be such a problem? Well, we may have some differences of opinion about this. I, I tend to think that nothing ever just happens that although there are cultural trends, ultimately people have to consciously decide we're going to take those steps forward. And that one of the things also that Take the Lead values very much and teaches women is how to do what I call sister courage. In other words, to join together with each other, to move forward together, women are more likely to keep going forward if they feel they have that support system. And so they have to learn to make that support system for themselves. We've got about a minute left. Do you see uh, a certain generation having to move on, if you will, before something like this evens itself out? 
Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I can tell you when I started out in journalism, which was a few years ago, um, I, women weren't in the business sections of newspapers. Women weren't, there were no female editors of newspapers and I, or publishers. And I saw that change dramatically in the last um, 20 or so years. And, it, and it's not going to change overnight. And women have to make sure it happens, but I definitely think it can happen. All right. Wednesday at Gamage, correct? Yes. All right. Good to have you both here. Thank Good to you. see you again. Thank you, Ted. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, physicist Lawrence Krauss will be here for the latest science news. And phosphorus is essential in food production, but we're running out of it. Learn about a new way to get more of it. That's Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.